So, Ankush, um, this is an area where I think uh, intuitively people might guess at this, but it is still um, uh, pretty outrageous when you lay out the data like you have in this piece. Uh, but you are making the argument that there's never been a better time to be a white collar criminal. Maybe we'll save for the end as to whether, you know, um, if this actually is generating more white collar crime or, or, or you know, whether the, having the cop essentially not on the beat uh, increases the amount of white collar crime or if it's simply that uh, people are not being taken off the 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 beat as it were and so there's just more crime to be committed but uh lay out some of the the specifics of your argument here so basically i think there are two fairly stark trends that we've seen over the last few years um that have become more pronounced in unprecedented ways under the Trump administration. Uh, the first is that the number of prosecutions for white collar crime uh, have fallen to an unprecedentedly low number, um, dropped again and again. So there've been at least three or four times at which the, the numbers hit a new unprecedented low based on data that Syracuse University maintains and that they've maintained for uh, uh, over 30 years. So this goes back a significant amount of time, and it's it's significant um, trend. Now, at the same time, you know, one hypothesis might be, well, we're enforcing these, you know, financial fraud laws and white-collar criminal laws less because maybe there's less crime. But on the other side of the ledger, the data seems to be pretty robust in showing that, in fact, um, white-collar crimes and financial frauds are at unprecedentedly high levels. Um, and unlike certain other crimes, like violent crime, the FBI doesn't conduct surveys to try to estimate the true prevalence of white-collar crime in the community, but there are data sources from within and outside the government. So the FBI tracks internet crime and has done so for about the last 20 years, and this year, internet crime hit an all-time high. The Federal Trade Commission tracks consumer fraud complaints. Those are at an all-time high. The uh, University of Pennsylvania uh, released a paper through its Institute of Law and Economics earlier this year showing that there had been uh, unprecedented levels of reports of misconduct to financial regulators. And even in the private sector, PricewaterhouseCoopers re uh, released a report earlier this year based on a survey of 5,000 companies throughout the world uh, who reported fraud and econ economic crime rates at, at record highs. So. That is about as consistent a trend and uh, body of evidence that I have seen. And it's sort of, you know, when I got into it, 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 I had this intuition, like you said, that maybe, you know, things are worse than they have been in the past. But I frankly did not expect to see it this stark. stark. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, I <clears throat> is there any even any evidence that maybe there is less um, arrests or investigations into white collar crime because in this era, uh, suddenly folks who used to engage in that um, have become just um, their integrity has increased and their sense of uh, obligation to society has increased. And therefore, people are just not committing these type of crimes. Is there is there even like uh, like, you know, just for the sake of. Of be of doing our due diligence, is there a, even the slightest hint that that's the case? You know, I, I don't think there's anything meaningful, and it is something we have to grasp for purposes of due, due, due diligence. You're right. I think that the closest that we could come to sort of feeling our way toward that hypothesis would be, well, you know, we're in the midst of a significant economic decline, and Traditionally, when that has happened over the last couple of decades, we have seen uh, an uptick in white collar enforcement, and um, we have seen sort of uh, enforcement authorities react and sort of dig up additional prosecutions and initiate uh, additional prosecutions. So it's sort of been tempting to see, you know, white collar crime is following this 
trend in which, you know, when the economy is doing well, they're at relatively low levels. And so until earlier this year, the economy was doing pretty well. And I think probably if you ask most people, they would have suspected that um, that suggested that, you know, there wasn't actually widespread, you know, corporate or financial malfeasance. But as I said, the data just does not back that up. So it, right. I, I find it very hard to see any scenario in which there is a real meaningful explanation for this besides actual uh, increases in the prevalence of misconduct. So uh, before we go into the, the, the details of, of this, um, what appears to be rollback in terms of enforcement of, of white collar crime, um, does the fact that the FBI does not keep track of these things. Um, does that th- does that indicate that maybe there is a pre-existing disposition against uh, pursuing white collar crimes? I mean, um, the uh, w- I've interviewed uh, Jesse Eisenberg on this uh, program, who wrote a uh, book called uh, "The uh, Chicken uh, Crap Club," more or less. <laughs> Um, and, and I mean, look, we also know, for instance, that the FBI, there is no, uh, you know, federal record keeping of, of things like, um, uh, police misconduct and whatnot. And there is a general sense that the government keeps data on stuff it really cares about and doesn't keep data on stuff that it's really not terribly invested in. Is there, is there a... And and without, you know, I think we've I think you have established that we're looking at records. But is there like, you know, is the was the bed made essentially? Is it you know, would it be harder to reduce enforcement of other things that the federal government pursues than this? Because there was already a significant amount of lack of will. Well, I think it's exactly it, it's very telling that the FBI does not um, conduct the sorts of surveys that it does for for violent crime, and I do think it does reflect um, a lesser, I guess, political or institutional willingness to um, pursue this sort of misconduct. And that's a long that's a long story. I mean, I think as, as Jesse Eisinger's book describes, you know, in the wake of nine eleven, a lot of FBI agents were reassigned from traditional white collar work to terrorism and homeland security type work. And that trend is largely held up. Um, but the you can't fix what you don't track. And as you said, I, I think it it tells us something that this is um, information that the government isn't even trying to collect in a systematic way. And now that they do the, the FBI data I, re- I referred to earlier they do track sort of actual complaints, but the there's a significant difference between that and what they do, for instance, in cases of sexual assault or um, robbery or burglary, where they actually try to pick up the phone or, or conduct through ordinary survey methods outreach to people throughout the country and learn whether or not they've been victimized, um, irrespective of whether they reported that um, victimization to law enforcement authorities or not. And so I do think it's it's quite stunning. And, you know, if, if I had my way and, you know, I could wave a magic wand, that would be the first and most obvious thing to fix in an apparatus that has, you know, been problematic for many years, but as I've tried to lay it out, gotten precipitously worse under this administration. But that needs to change. I mean, I, I see no defensible explanation uh, for that at all. All right. So let's talk about the different things that are um, inhibiting the or presumably inhibiting the pursuit of these white collar cr- crimes. I mean, you one of the things you lay out is just simply other priorities. Um, certainly in the wake of 9-11, a lot of investigatory apparatus was focused on tracking financial, uh, you know, terrorism's financial ties and whatnot. Um, is there a similar analog here? Yeah, I mean, I think that there have been uh, concerted efforts during this administration to focus first on immigration 
and, you know, under the Sessions regime, that was his sort of singular focus. And that attracted a lot of um, resources within the department and attention um, publicly. It's uh, a, a, a truly shameful, I think, um, period of the history of the Justice Department that that particular crackdown in the family separation policy and one that I think needs to be excavated in the next administration. But but nevertheless, for our current purposes, that was um, a serious diversion of attention and resources to a problem of uh, debatable significance. But factually, that was a significant diversion of attention and resources. And, you know, since then, his permanent successor, at least Bill Barr, has focused seemingly on, you know, uh, political retribution um, through Justice Department mechanisms um, for the Russiagate investigation, the Mueller investigation. And, you know, this is a whole separate discussion that, you know, you've had in, in separate pieces many times before. But, um, you know, he's he's been very willing to use the Justice Department as an arm of the president's sort of personal and political um, agenda and, and grievance grievances. So um, it, it's not um, the only reason for by any means, but you know the attorney generals have a lot of influence, obviously, in how they set the agenda for the agency and the and, and the sorts of things that prosecutors go after. And this has not been their priority by any means. So um, there's a bunch of other priorities, and there's been also, uh, you write about policy changes that have impacted uh, the, these type of investigations. Um, outline those for us. Yeah, you know, there have been a few um, notable policy changes. Um, one is a policy expansion, really, under the tail end of the uh, uh, Obama administration, there was an effort to um, introduce a pilot program for foreign bribery investigations in which there was sort of an explicit policy that if you self-reported um, your company's misconduct, that the government might sort of give you a pass. Um, self-reported and sort of fully cooperated and disclosed all the underlying uh, misconduct. There is some merit, arguable merit to that in the context of corporate foreign bribery, because there are already significant difficulties that the government has detecting and pursuing that sort of conduct. But that policy got expanded um, basically more globally under this administration, and it allows prosecutors to decline pursuing corporate criminal cases um, if they self-report and cooperate with investigators. And a separate policy which has been referred to as sort of the anti-piling on policy, the policy in which the Justice Department has said, well, you know, if there are parallel criminal and civil investigations and civil regulators are um, entering into a resolution and imposing a fine, well, it just doesn't make sense for the Justice Department to quote unquote pile on and, um, and uh, impose even further fines. Now, there was already a mechanism for the Justice Department to account for um, the existence and resolution of parallel proceedings, but this made uh, explicit and more prominent the notion that, well, if you have sort of paid um, civil regulators for some potential misconduct, then you know, the Justice Department that may not need to get involved or may need to uh, do so in a, in a more lenient capacity. And um, third, you know, the end of the Obama administration, there was a policy put in place that um, encouraged um, prosecutors to focus more intently on prosecuting individuals in the context of these sort of widespread spread, um, corporate criminal cases. And, and that policy had been enacted in response to the anger, justifiable anger, really, that people throughout the country had about there being very few you pretty much no real meaningful prosecutions um, at a high level in the wake of the financial crisis. There are lots and lots of settlements and lots of fines paid to the Justice Department and civil regulators, but um, uh, very few um, actual criminal prosecutions. And so uh, the Deputy Attorney General, Sally Yates, 
wrote a memo saying, well, look, you can't just you know, settle these cases and move on. If you're prosecuting these cases, you need to uh, pursue individuals in a very serious, robust way. And then it laid out a series of steps for uh, prosecutors to do that. And that policy has been rolled back uh, under this administration, which basically makes it acceptable to sort of enter into a multi-million dollar settlement with a company uh, and move along without uh, prosecuting anyone necessarily, but without really forcing prosecutors to pursue all of the relevant individual wrongdoers. So those sorts of uh, programmatic policy changes have been um, relatively few, but they are significant, particularly in the white collar context. So, I mean, the last two, at the very least, were um, one, if you commit a bunch of crimes, you get a couple of freebies, essentially. Uh, and the other is, is that you, uh, really can hide behind this corporate shield and don't have to take any personal accountability. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the freebie policy, if you put it, 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 I mean, it's well put because basically like if you, um, you get a pass on your first one, really, if you just admit it, um, uh, <laughs> would be the most simple way of putting it. Um, and, uh, that's a simplistic account of it, but, um, you know, the policy is not a good policy and, um, problematic for, for that reason. Um, all right. So, so with all this said, and, and, there, and there's one other element that's going on here, right? I mean, they have other priorities, which provide them, you know, where they right, divert resources. They have policy changes that sort of, um, I guess, you know, once you have diverted those resources, you make some policy changes that make it very easy for you to rubber stamp and essentially slap people on the wrist, you know, or, or at the very least, you know, pat them on the back, it almost sounds like in some instances. They also, the Justice Department has a, uh, and, and, you know, I've, I've spoken to people who are in the Justice Department during the Clinton administration and then came back during the Obama administration to talk about the degradation, frankly, of uh, different divisions of the Justice Department as a function of the administration not being interested in the missions of specific departments in the uh, in DOJ. And so what happens is people get discouraged. They leave. You lose some institutional um, uh, memory. Uh, people who are contemplating moving into the government, they see that there's no place for them to go and they don't want to get anywhere near it because of the administration. And so there is no sort of like bench or uh, folks coming up. And you you uh, talk about uh, and you write about in the uh, piece about political appointees who are um, seem completely inept and unqualified to be doing the things that they're doing. And A, tell us about those, but B, how much of that is a part of what Steve Bannon announced within the first six months of this administration was their agenda is to deconstruct the administrative state. And, the, and it's a very easy thing to do, right? I mean, you don't have to be a genius to tear these things down. In fact, it helps if you're not a genius and you'll be appointed <laughs> in an important position, and you'll just let it basically die on the vine. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, so to take the first piece, there there have been some really stunning, I think, appointments um, and promotions even at the career level. But to take some prominent, you know, political appointments, I was, uh, I mentioned a guy in the piece named Bill Hughes, who is um, an associate deputy attorney general and who is leading the administration's um, criminal enforcement effort regarding coronavirus-related misconduct. Um, I happened to be at home just watching a hearing that he was testifying at before the Senate Judiciary Committee with several other people. I had never heard of or seen the guy before, um, and I was just watching it, and I was just sort of slack-jawed because I just he just seemed like in in way over his head. And so I just kind of went and looked up his bio on LinkedIn, and it turns out he is um, – has no experience in the Justice Department. He was in private practice and then at the White House. Um, and his only real contact with the internal workings of the Justice Department was working as a law student intern 15 years ago 
uh, at a U.S. attorney's office, and this man is supposed to be um, coordinating our response to potential criminal misconduct throughout the country arising from coronavirus, and he's in over his head. And, and uh, you know, that bio, once I saw it, really, I was still stunned, but it made m- more sense of the fact that he just seemed completely uninformed and ignorant of a lot of basic um, features of sort of the criminal process. He couldn't answer very basic questions that Senator Dianne Feinstein was putting to him about, like, well, what are you going to do to arrest and actually convict people? Um, which is a question that is simple on its face, but to answer it in any meaningful way, you do have to actually understand a little thing or two about how criminal prosecutions and investigations work. And he appears not not to do so. Um, another guy um, who was until recently the head of the criminal division, who I don't talk about in the piece, but it is this guy named Brian Benchikowski, who um, I had met on a couple of occasions, perfectly nice guy um, interpersonally, but um, he had never actually been a prosecutor before he became the head of the criminal division. Um, and so as a result, um, you know, he had very little uh, understanding coming into the job of how like actual criminal prosecutions work. And, you know, if you don't understand how these things work, you're not going to be able to really ask the right questions the right, and, and set interesting or creative priorities. And I do think that there is a sense in which at best um, there's indifference that allows people like that to be put into positions of importance like that. But there is kind of, I, I, I do have the similar sort of feeling that there is a sort of a sense in which it's sort of a a deliberate policy of sort of putting in place people who will sort of let these, um, let the, let the sort of apparatus kind of wither a little bit, because I think in the long term, it does take a toll to have inexperienced and sort of, um, unknowledgeable people at the helm, you know, good career people leave. Um, They don't really put up with it. They don't like it. They don't enjoy their jobs. And that institutional knowledge is, is not really replaceable. And at the same time, you know, one of the things, dynamics, I think that has been um, not fully explored, I think uh, publicly, but one of the things I wanted to get into in my piece was that there's been this sort of vacuum at the senior career levels um, that has allowed really unqualified career people to migrate to very, very senior positions. Um, and I mentioned a couple people who, who worked in the office I worked in who, uh, you know, they were perfectly fine, you know, interpersonally by and large, um, but on paper they had no business holding the positions that they hold. And, um, you know, again, by itself, maybe, you know, this isn't so bad or you can't draw a one-to-one comparison between that and, and the real um, pervasive problem we have, but it is one more piece of this really cool, you know, holistic problem we have. It's like, you don't have, you don't care about it. You don't have the right people in place. Um, and uh, it's a significant problem in and of itself. So it, it seems like we have um, two, two, uh, two significant problems. One is, is that it is basically open season on citizens and consumers and and presumably i guess other businesses because there is a um significant absence of investigation and uh, essentially policing of these white collar crimes and then the other is is that it's not just like it's been you know the apparatus has been dipped in amber and uh, somebody's just waiting for it to thaw out in some fashion the apparatus is being deconstructed. So here's uh, my question is, and, and we obviously, we can't really know, uh, we have some figures in terms of like cost, but we can't really know the price that is being paid by people who are subjected to more crime because of the lack of enforcement. Do you have a sense of what's happening with the infrastructure? Like, When Joe Biden comes, uh, if Joe Biden's president and presumably um, different people are put at the DOJ, can they come in and fix this initially? I mean, and and let's be clear. I mean, um, we had an attorney general under Obama who had a, you know, very closely hewed to a notion of, you know, too big to to jail 
Um, and so, you know, we didn't start off from a, a decent place. It just seems like we've been able to sort of deconstruct an apparatus that was insufficient in, in many respects to begin with. Yeah, you know, this is – that is correct. I mean, the piece that I wrote focuses on kind of the, the sort of the bottom falling out under the Trump administration, but this was already a problem even under the Obama administration. Um, and I think it got more attention, fortunately, and at least some um, attention from Congress and the media, but because of sort of the swarm of incessant scandals um, in this administration, it's sort of fallen by the wayside. But um, I actually, I'm deeply concerned actually about what might happen in a Biden administration, not because I think he or his people would be um, uh, uh, have bad intentions, but just because I've sent, frankly seen no indication that he that they, the campaign is interested in this particular issue, at least publicly. And, you know, Biden was the vice president under Obama. And if we have a return of some of the same people who held senior positions under the Obama DOJ, some of them were quite good. Um, but we can't really expect things to change um, with, with the same sorts of people in place. And I think the challenge is harder now um, because, as you say, you know, you have sort of the um, – a, a, an institutional rap, apparatus that has not been held in amber. And it's it's not something that you can just flip a switch on. Um, a lot of serious thought needs to be given to not just programmatic and policy issues, but staffing issues, resource issues, prioritization of certain uh, uh, areas of enforcement over others. And I, I don't think it's a problem that can be fixed um, just with a new group of people. I think it will take uh, not just a new group of people, although I think that's a necessary but not sufficient condition, but a very concerted effort to look at all levels of the problem um, and to think, you know, creatively about, well, what can we be doing differently, um, you know, even irrespective of Trump? I mean, my, one, one thing that I think has gotten into, uh, come into stark relief under the Trump administration, but uh, again, it's sort of a years long trend is like the financial international financial system has just become so opaque and so prone to abuse uh, and misuse by financial criminals that um, I don't really think the domestic law enforcement apparatus has has kept up with it. Um, and I think we need not just a new group of people, but people who are going to come in and think hard, long and hard about this and expansively. Um, about how to kind of uh, um, change directions. Uh, I'm not going to hold my breath, but hope springs, uh, springs eternal. Ankush Kadari, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.